Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. I mean, I don't know about spoilers for the movie. There's only, there are spoilers for the movie, even though Daniel Spinoza, the director, a week before the movie's release, did an interview with Cinema Blend and explained everything that happens in the movie, including the post credit scenes. Did he really? Yeah, which is nuts. But, I mean, the only the only way this movie's going to be talked about is to talk about it in its entirety. I mean, if you d- I didn't already guess the entire plot based on the trailers... I don't know what to tell you, even though half the footage in the trailers isn't even in the movie. Uh, So right up front, I'm just going to ask, would you recommend? No. Okay. (laughs) I also would not recommend uh, the movie. We'll do the whole (laughs) summary thing. And you know this is bad. Can I tell you my theory? Can I tell you my theory about this movie? Okay, sure. I think that, I think like the trailer, I think the stuff in the trailer perhaps was intended to be in the movie except for the Oscorp shot from the trailer and I'll explain that I think Sony has like a plan I think Sony's working better with Marvel now I this is all speculation but I think they're probably more in tandem now but I think Marvel was so close-knit about what their plans were for the future because they typically are Uh, they have a really good system for protecting spoilers plot lines stuff like that And I think Sony at some point was sort of just like, I don't really know what to expect. So they kind of just threw everything at the wall in that trailer, apart from the fact that it would, apart from the fact that it would draw us in. And then No Way Home comes out, the final cuts out, and then Disney's now maybe opening up the door a little to say, okay, this is actually what we're planning. And Sony's going, oh, well, if that's what you're doing, then some of that stuff in the trailer, we probably have to cut from the movie because that's not a thing. The reason I think this is because they have the shot where you see Raimi Spider-Man with the word murderer over it, and in No Way Home, um, the opening scene is, of course, everyone calling Spider-Man a murderer for killing Mysterio. And so I was curious, wondering if there was going to be some sort of like, okay, we're in a different multiverse where now they just think he's a murderer or something. But that might have been because they were thinking of continuing a contract or making maybe making a contract with toby mcguire and then if that fell through they're like well we can't put that in the movie so i think they're also probably just trying to figure out which spider-man they want which may explain why they extended why they delayed this movie an additional month like just one more month to what do like a couple edits or something to make sure it's refined boy that sure worked didn't it (laughs) (laughs) this movie had so many delays reshoots test screenings that went not well and that, so they did things again. I think it's weird that this movie was treated like New Mutants and some others in, in the film. I, I guess in like, I don't know about film Twitter because I'm not on it, but like in film communities, like I even was listening to another podcast treat it like, finally, this movie's coming out. It's been so long. It's like, this does not compare to like New Mutants or um, there's one, uh, oh, uh, Chaos Walking, where those movies were like, mysteriously delayed with tons of drama behind the scenes this one was more just like it was delayed and everyone well maybe it's because it's it became a meme it became a joke the meme and joke but like it just doesn't feel the same like this one was more like 
like New Mutants felt like a different movie and the editing could not prevent that with scenes that were just baffling. I mean, I have a write up on the website. People can check it out on that. And it's, it's, it's just totally different than this where like this could have been even 15 minutes shorter if it cut all the police stuff in the movie, which was already significantly come back. It's just really strange. Um, but that's, that's why I think that some of the stuff in the trailer could have been in it, except for the Oscorp one, which I believe is because there's a wide shot. That's a setting shot to say, Hey, you're in New York. Not that we've ever left New York, except for one scene in the beginning, which threw me off, uh, where they're in Sweden for some reason. And, on the left side of the setting shot is a bunch of sky where you see all these skyscrapers and then the left side just sky. And I was like, oh my gosh, is that just the scene from the trailer where they just CG'd in the Oscorp building from Amazing Spider-Man, but now they just took it out? Like, what's going on? But so yeah, look, no, there's nothing, nothing from the trailers really in the movie except for that terrible shot where he's flying in front of a subway. Weirdly, there's too much in the trailer and things that aren't in the movie at all. I don't know how they pulled that off. They wanted something to put on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> something to be significant. Uh, Daniel Espinosa was asked about the Spider-Man thing, and he says he literally doesn't know why that was in the trailers. <laughs> he, he said he doesn't know why it was added, and he doesn't know why it was later removed. There's a ton of theories going around. I heard, to add on to your speculation, there's a lot of speculation that Feige actually was one of the people that watched one of the early screenings, and at his request removed some stuff because he just saw the movie and was like oh this is bad and then just like please remove all those things that could even tendentially connect it to this franchise the movie kept getting re having reshoots and re-edits in response to things that were happening like very clearly and we'll get into it at the end of the episode because you know it's the thing people want to talk about but um, oh man the, it's the all worst. the stuff with it's just like with batman dude <laughs> <laughs> it's the all, worst all the things that you want to talk about were also reshot clearly in response to the events oh, of yeah. spider-man no way home the cinematography was completely different <laughs> i i mean even that it's, bothered me in this movie a different version of the scenes is in the is in the trailers so it's obviously yeah. reshoots yeah incredible Hey there, it's your friendly neighborhood call to action. Just checking in on you. Hope you're doing all right. I'm just stopping by to say, you know, if you enjoy the show, you can always subscribe and write a review for Cinematic Doctrine. There's iTunes, Podchaser, basically anywhere you listen. You can give us a shout out with a thumbs up, five stars, gripping positivity. Or if you hate the show, you can say that too. Wait, what? What are you saying? Why are you saying that? Well, I'm not going to tell them what to do, Ted. They're free to do what they want. Our analytics say we got a lot of listeners in the U.S., and you know they love their freedoms. And you're also free to check out our Twitter. Very active there. We host polls, memes. There's also the Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group called Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group. If you want to join, just answer the questions, read the rules, and tell them the podcast sent you. Also, you should check out our website. Some really cool stuff there. Editorials, written reviews for movies we haven't had time to cover. Always check out cinematicdoctrine.com when you get the chance. Oh, uh, Ted also told me I shouldn't forget to mention the Patreon. Something about you can support us or something? Wait, Ted, I thought this was like a hobby thing. You it's want to me to... expand Cinematic Doctrine. You know right, this already. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, <laughs> I forgot. I'm the one who put all this together. Yeah, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you can gain access to early uncut episodes of the podcast. Oh, and did I mention, you get to tell us what to do. That's right, each month you get to vote on a movie we discuss on the show. Anyways, I gotta run, so I'll see you guys later. Okay, first, so, there'll be one question that I'm going to ask you after... I'm going to briefly summarize as best I can the movie. I'm going to outright ask you something. So mentally prepare to be berated. Mm, got it. I'm going to eat some Cheerios while you do that because I okay. haven't had breakfast today. <laughs> <laughs> Loudly and in one ear ASMR in the other ear uh, description of Morbius. Mm. Could, could you be so lucky? Uh, so Morbius is a movie that nobody wanted. Or, <laughs> but for some reason, Morbius yeah. has been... Almost in movies a lot, uh, he was initially slated to be the villain of Blade 2. There even is famously a deleted scene from the first Blade, which you can get on the DVD copy, where 
uh, bl- where Morbius is seen in the distance as Blade looks at him. Portrayed by Stephen Norrington, the director of the film. However, when Guillermo del Toro was doing Blade 2, for some, whatever reason, Marvel didn't give him the rights to use the character. Uh, and for there, Morbius just kept getting kicked around as a thing that might exist. He was slated to be a villain that appeared in the Amazing Spider-Man films. There was an interactive website where you could go to like the Oscorp computer, and they actually had a profile on Morbius leading up to Amazing Spider-Man 2. However, uh, when that entire franchise just fell apart, again, Morbius was both put on ice, but still continuously fast-tracked towards production for whatever reason. And uh, Morbius is not a character who's particularly popular, sort of. Like, the idea of Morbius has always been sort of popular, which is he's a tragic tragic here, villain who doesn't who's only a villain because of a disease he has he's also a vampire without the limitations of a vampire so he's kind of can be a fun anti-hero character people would really like the midnight suns team which he's on but he doesn't really appear in many notable comic book stories uh, or ha- he doesn't have like a signature event thing like craven has craven's last hunt and so on morbius does not so for what about for whatever reason he was just pegged as a character that he really wanted and so after Tons and tons of delays, changes of actors and whatever. Finally, Jared Leto was cast in the titular role and the movie went forward with the writers of The Last Witch Hunt, Gods of Egypt and Dracula Untold. Playing the screenplay. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, he's written vampires before he could do it again. Uh, so not to brag. I Why know they that sound like, like high fives ghost. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what I figure. Sony executives sound like is high five ghost. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> um they have also you think this pen- is gonna line up with the spider-man <laughs> timeline <laughs> uh, they are also tentatively planned to write the madame web bo- movie well, bro you so, gotta find out which timeline uh, we're gonna work with <laughs> bro what timeline we're working with bro um <laughs> anywho so <laughs> uh the movie would have been so better <laughs> if it was just mordecai and rigby's fault that morbius got made <laughs> i will say that there's dude kind of- why were we on this boat in the first place i don't know man <laughs> gotta get off there's a vampire here just, they're like panic their hands are covered in this blood. is all your fault rigby stop talking <laughs> this is going well uh <laughs> somebody make a tiktok thank you <laughs> that's a whole tiktok profile already yeah yeah sony does the same thing that marvel does where they have people they've just you know they got good relations with so daniel espinoza who previously directed the movie life uh is at the helm here and you know, I just I, I don't it's one of those things where I don't know why anyone involved signed on for the project. I know Matt Smith signed on to play the villain because he likes Espinoza. But outside of that, I'm not sure why anyone signed on. But any anyway, so Morbius is the story of one Michael Morbius. He has a rare movie blood disease that is impossibly <laughs> deadly. I, I I know this is a dumb thing to, to, to rag on, but his disease requires you to get three blood transfusions a day. And. I don't know how anyone could survive this predicament. I don't know how you get funding to help that. But he is a sad boy who is in a hospital. All the kids who are in the bed next to him constantly die until one day. uh, Another kid whose name I don't remember, except he calls him Milo because the first kid in the bed was Milo. So every kid who comes in. I kept thinking Lazarus. And I'm like, no, that's in Batman. And it's not a character. It's a pit. (laughs) (laughs) Not sure sure how your brain went. went Well, because his name is like L something. Well, he was supposed to be Loxious Crane, who is hunger in the comics. But that was changed at some point for whatever reason. So is he an original the character? He's an original character based on the character hunger. It's like the Catwoman situation. Did they not have the rights? No, he was initially announced as hunger. I don't know, man. (laughs) I don't know. They announced him as Loxious Crane, who is Hunger, who's not a big character, but he's evil vampire. So I was like, okay, they're just doing what they've done with the other two movies, which is the same character, but worse is the villain. That's but what Sony keeps doing. What do you strange. think? What are they going to do with Craven then? It's like Craven the Hunter, and then it's a Huntress. Well, I have thoughts on Craven and the whole Sony thing um, that I think. Uh, yeah, we can, we can get get into. I, I have some feelings on it. This movie's interesting because at the end of the day, it's just so someone in Sony, some executive has just a wall collection of Sinister Six stuff and is desperate to see <laughs> this have, movie made. They have string and sticky notes and they're circulating. There's like those I, photos of those weeboos that have like the room with all of their anime products and there's yeah, like body clothes on the wall, but this pillows. guy does it for Sinister Six. <laughs> he's, he's got Chameleon and Mysterio yeah. and doc ock um but yeah michael morbius is super talented science guy 
he gets a Nobel Peace Prize, but he turns it down because he's cool. He has created synthetic blood, which is very convenient for him. And he bonds with young Milo as a kid because they're survivors of this horrible disease. Milo becomes <laughs> Why really... did they change his name? It's so I don't know. Weird. There's I have so no many idea. weird choices. Maybe they're saving hunger for a big team up. I don't know. Like yeah, but like they... in the in the movie, he changes his name, and then for the rest of the movie, he's just called Milo, which is yeah. crazy. I guess Why'd it's a term that? of endearment, like like it's their pet nickname for each other. I don't know. It's a weird dynamic they have, but yeah. So. If it sounds like the the opening hour of the movie is an extended origin story for Michael Morbius, which is dumb because he's a vampire. You don't really need that much backstory. And it'd be one thing if it really gave him more like root as a character or something, but it really doesn't. He just comes off as doesn't get used a guy because it. I, I I will say that the first forty ish minutes, I think it ends when Matt Smith shows up to see morbius testing himself but that first 40 minutes was enough to get me interested and then it just sort of deflates it's like if you were (sighs) if you have asthma and you're trying to blow balloons and then like you just get tired and you just stop that's this movie it just it deflates because i liked when he's testing himself i like when he's like what other things do i do like of course i like that that's that's origin story 101 you got to have your character doing the test testing stuff but i liked in this that it was basically like a weirdo body horror and he's like taking notes because he's a scientist but then but then i realized that's only like eight minutes out of an hour and 44 minutes so I yeah can't well, consider that good okay let me just to, just to quickly quickly summarize the events as they unfold michael morbius scientist he has a doctor he works with who is his love interest also matt smith plays the villain slash his best friend they both have a disease that caused them to walk on crutches they're immobile they're supposed to die when they're like 35 or 40 they're both way way above life expectations matt smith is extremely wealthy for reasons i never quite understood he just has limitless money i don't yeah, know was how he supposed to be a gangster i don't know i have no idea why he has so much money but he's he's been he's a bottomless pit where he keeps funding mac morbius's uh research he decides that vampire bats are the thing that can cure him because that just happens a lot in comic books for some reason. See also man thing. And I mean, sorry, uh, man. man, bat. Bat. man and bat. so he goes in a ship. It goes horribly awry or he turns himself into a vampire. He kills all the people on the boat. Being a vampire also gives him the ability to swim from wherever he is back home really quickly. For some reason, he goes home. He realizes that drinking blood keeps him from turning into a horrible, evil vampire man. But he doesn't want to drink human blood because that's the drama. And then, yeah, from there, the movie just kind of deflates because there's nothing for him to do. He doesn't have an arch nemesis. There's no real antagonist for a long time. He just becomes Morbius. And then everything you should do in a superhero movie, they just don't. It's really strange. There isn't the sequence where he starts stopping muggers and realizes he wants to be a hero. It's just more stuff just keeps happening to him. Uh, Understandably, Matt Smith is like, hey, I'd rather be a vampire than dead. And he's like, no, don't do that. And then he becomes a vampire at some point. Then Tyrese Gibson is just chasing around a bit, and then they fight, and it's terrible, and then he hunger dies, and then the movie's just over. Like, that's all that happens. It's really weird, like, the structure of the movie. It feels four hours, even though it's only, like, an hour and 40. Everything I described is all the events that happens in the movie. I don't... Is there anything I'm forgetting other than the post credit scenes? Uh, you think he's going to start mugging some bad guys, but then he just takes their lab. <laughs> which was weird <laughs> okay yeah there's individual scenes there's one really bizarre scene that someone else on twitter point was strange like there's a scene where they're looking for the uh, the doctor he works with they go to her house they see that she has a there's a cat litter box he shakes the litter box and when the cat doesn't come he goes guess the cat's gone it's like why would a cat come running if you shake its litter box it's just weird like weird stuff throughout the movie like this where it feels like the movie was written by aliens yeah. And that's everything. But There's not in the fun way. No, it's just extremely yeah. boring. So with all that said, I'm going to ask, is this the worst comic book film you've ever seen? Oh, no. I well, oh, um, hmm. See, so, right, right? Cause it's, because it's, it's not it's not a disaster or anything. Okay, people you know? always go, people always go, Daredevil and Catwoman are the worst. But those are fun to watch. Yes. Those are really fun to watch. Yes, I'm pounding they're, my desk in agreement. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> they're fun to watch. They're funny. They're They're cool. This movie actually repulses me. Like the whole, like when it shows him using his ear power was so disgusting. <laughs> I had to look away. It was so grotesque. Um, 
And it's like, it's not body horror, but like that was... It's just unpleasant to look at. It's just unpleasant to look at. And like, if it wanted to be body horror, that would have been pretty cool. They should have had... Did you did you watch Antlers yet? No, I haven't seen Antlers. Well, there's just a scene where like a person's transforming and it's super grotesque. And like, if they did that, like with Morbius, like this is a curse. And it's like, we've watched long enough to know, yes, this is actually a curse. That would be really cool. Like his teeth coming in. They could have done the whole weird uh, Wolverine thing where like when his blades come out, it hurts every time. Like they could have mm, done that with mm. like this stuff. Like he could just be like, it's a curse. My bone structure just <laughs> reconstructs every time in my face. It's horrible. I have to get ice packs every time I come back to normal. They, they try a little bit with the whole concept of he doesn't want to drink human blood, but there's never a scene. This movie's really void of scenes that you should have in a movie. Of tension. There's no scene where like he kills a person. It's a vampire thing. Vampires are all about repressed. They're they're a, they're things, a metaphor you know. about repressed things. And yeah. this movie is one of the only times where I agree with Letterbox and the Letterbox culture where I'm like, this movie would have been better if it was gayer because the repressed <laughs> like nature of the characters would have been more compelling in how they like they're resisting the temptation, which is vampires. I yes. don't want to drink blood, but it's killing me inside. E- and like yeah. there's no tension throughout the movie to do that. I yeah, I am baffled. I am absolutely baffled by the fact that this movie, it seemed like up and down, they did not want to make a movie about vampires. They did everything they could yeah, to avoid being a vampire like, movie. It's it was really weird. So strange. Um, because <laughs> vampires open itself up to tension. Like, if I do this thing, some other person dies. But I need to do this thing to survive. Is there a way I can survive without doing the thing that kills people and satiates this hunger is there a way to ever embrace this particular thing without it being wrong yeah living with a demon inside that's what yeah thing, you know? and that's compelling but then this movie doesn't have anything <laughs> compulsory to to, to to engage my brain it's just very boring right there's there's that first scene and there should be that first scene where he realizes he's a vampire right and he's really hungry and he sees a person and he has to f- either fight himself to stop from killing them, or he does, and the whole movie, like, the guilt of that ha- haunts him the rest of the movie. Instead, they do the superhero thing where it's like, I'm Jack now, and he's documenting his powers. Yes, there's a first sequence where he kills all of the guys on the ship, but they are, the movie goes out of its way to mention these are real bad dudes. They even include a scene where a guy is just needlessly, like, sexist and horrible towards the to to the the doctor and they get seriously bloodless deft like yes the one guy like pg-13 the the guy grabs his neck because he's supposed to be spurting yeah they include the sound effects too and there was sound effects i just said yeah and but then you look and there's no there's nothing there's just nothing there (laughs) this is really weird it looked like he was choking on some food he just ate (laughs) like he just yeah it just falls over (laughs) and morbius michael morbius there's two things that should happen at this point he should either feel bad about killing all those dudes but there's also isn't a scene where he realizes he can walk because, again, the big thing in the movie is that this disease is every bad disease all at once. He walks on crutches. He can't move. He's daily blood transfusions. And like they make great effort to point out this is a horrible burden. And it's the villain's entire motivation. But after Michael Morbius gets superpowers, there isn't that scene where he's like, I can walk. And he like walks around. He goes out in the sun. He goes running for the first time. There's none of that. It's just him in a lab going i got echolocation now you know so like if he's already doing natural blood mutations why does he not feel okay just taking blood through his mouth i mean the mouth is just the normal way that the body intakes nutrients and if he's doing ivs which you can also do for nutrients what's his reason for not just drinking blood as opposed to injecting blood i don't understand why he had to switch to specifically taking the fake blood? I, I guess for him, it's the line he's on a cross. You know, once he gets a taste for the real stuff, you know, <laughs> then it's, it's like switching from like Diet Coke to, to regular Coke with, with the sugar. It's like the know. blue from Breaking Bad. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just weird. He's, he's had a hit of the good stuff. There is a part of me that like, is almost like, what's the point of talking about this movie? Like, <laughs> I Even my letterbox review is so, so insignificantly small. There's weirdly a lot to talk about, in my opinion, just in terms of how wrong every decision they make is. Right. But yeah. at the same time, like, you don't want to just be a podcast where you're just like, this movie, this movie everyone says is bad, is as bad as everyone says it is. But, like, the reason I ask you is, is this the worst one? Because, yeah, 
something like like Ben Affleck Daredevil or Catwoman or Green Lantern or the Fantastic Four movies, you take your pick, um, are all quote unquote objectively worse than this. But this is so boring. There is it is so lifeless, so lacking in any sort of personality or drive or or reason to exist. My favorite, the nerdist's title for the review was <laughs> Morbius is a perfunctory reminder that sony owns the rights to the character morpheus and i will say sony bunch from the bulwark had a great review where he talks about like it's so bizarre this character is a movie at all because this is this is a c minus d plus level character like venom makes no sense as a character for a solo movie because the entire reason for being is spider-man but you can see why someone would want a movie about it. He's a popular character. He has a whole anti-hero run. There's he has tons of like stuff in the mythos that you can draw from. And also, you get a sense that Tom Hardy really likes playing Betty Brock and Tom Venom. Hardy has a lot of fun. He's like a story by credit for Venom Two. Like this actually like compelled me to raise my score for Venom Two up a half star. So now yeah. it's a three out of ten instead of a two out of ten. <laughs> just because I realized like that actually is more in it. Like if I rewatch it, I think I'll be in on the joke. I was just frustrated that it was a joke because I wanted the movie to be authentic. Something. But the whole movie's <laughs> just a joke. I but to to give a more definitive answer, no, this is not the worst one. I, I actually opened up a letterbox list of just superhero movies. Um the person has ranked it and for themselves, but I was like, yeah, I'll probably line up with them too. And I remembered Wonder Woman eighty four existed. That one is too long and boring. If you cut Wonder Woman 84 to a 90 minutes, <laughs> how do you think it would shape up? I, I guess it could be better <laughs> and I can keep up with the action sequences better. And Pedro Pascal is a lot of fun in that too. But also Matt Smith was really fun in this. Um, He's the one good little, thing in this movie. <laughs> for the little things that he does. I just like dance sequences. I like people being, <laughs> I love people when they murder people and then dance. <laughs> Something about that makes my heart feel warm. Right. So that's always enjoyable. Uh, I have a lot of nice things to say. About Matt. Like Matt Smith, I lo- I'm a big Doctor Who fan. And so the, he's the, such a good performer. And this is the second time I've seen him in a villain role. And he has such a transfixing so, charisma yeah. that when he's evil, it's like more terrifying. There's actually one shot in this where it's um, Morbius is awkwardly kissing his uh, doctor uh, assistant. Uh, on top of the building of their of their lab or whatever it's like near the end of the film and matt smith is on a bridge looking at them and there's just a shot of Which his reaction was funny because it's a sudden a sudden cut to just matt it's smith. a sudden cut so it's pretty <laughs> funny but i i actually was like whoa his face is scary which is evoking the uh shining uh not evoking shining intentionally the but kubrick the, stare the kubrick stare of which like have your actor just look scary and i was like oh man this is good like he looks intimidating he looks scary he is portraying exactly the thing that he wants to with his face without saying a single word so I, matt smith is good innocent fine if i really think he was more conventionally attractive he'd be more stuff but like the interesting thing about him is that's former- interesting i don't i never have found him to be unconventionally attractive i think it's because maybe do you say that because people agree he has a Bro- since he's so broad he looks like a cartoon character because he's always <laughs> he, had he just but that's also because he performed like a cartoon character in dr who so i yeah i'm i'm not gonna be mean about his parents but i'm not i but everyone he, has a look i look what do i look like dan what do i look like you look like you <laughs> know a lot of pop figures <laughs> that's, that's so that's unfortunately that's the meanest thing you can say about me uh, <laughs> Uh, but partly it's it's they got me with the pokemon pops they're so cute <laughs> this wasn't an opportunity for you to confess like you're saying and i've gotten the office ones as well uh no but like that's candy man just, ones he has i'll just say his unique look his unique facial proportions but i think as part of his allure is that maybe he's not somebody that like if you just saw him there's a great there's a great scene in the bar in this movie where like if you just saw him at a bar you wouldn't like go approach him but like the way he carries himself the way he talks to you there is something kind of mesmerizing about him, which as a when he's evil actually comes off as a lot more menacing yes. and like genuinely kind of creepy. Like if this was just a movie about a vampire played by Matt Smith, he was running around murdering people. If it was a vampire movie like we wish it was, <laughs> it would be something. But his vampires are alluring. Like that makes it great. I mean, and they could have done that with Morbius. I mean, he's 30 seconds to Mars. He is every teenage girl's dream at the time. Now he's a creep, but like <laughs> it works. And then like, they just don't do a vampire movie. So it 
doesn't work. <laughs> Plus, vampires would be something. Like, when I say this is worse. So, okay. When you watch, I'm just, I'm just going to use them as an example. When you watch um, the Ben Affleck Daredevil movie, right? It's a weird thing that in the middle of a fight, there's a fight scene that's just a wire foo Hong Kong action scene at a playground. That's a weird decision. You could say it's a bad decision, but that is a decision somebody consciously made in the movie. Say whatever you want about Zack Snyder's take on Kiro. Say whatever you want about Sam Raimi's choice of like to do kind of like an exaggerated take on characters where everyone act a little goofy. Say whatever you want about literally any superhero film you've ever seen. The bizarre basketball scene in Catwoman. The... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Everything about the Ghost Rider movies from uh, Nicolas Cage's performance to the really perfunctory and strange sequel they made. All of those feel like somebody sat down and said, this should be in the movie. This is my vision for the movie. They are weird decisions, but they they are a decision made by someone. Morbius feels like it's one of those like you see those like viral posts where someone's like, oh, I fed an AI a bunch of scripts. And those are all fake. Usually actually made by one person. But this feels like a AI generated superhero film. Where they just said, like, you have a hero, a villain, he gets powers, something happens. There's no decisions here. There's nothing here for us to glom on. There's so you nothing think here it's for us committee. to comment on. You think this is a committee movie? It's a, it's it's somebody, yeah, somebody in a suit said, Jared Leto's a pretty popular actor, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. He's in memes, right? Uh... People know that name. And two years Damaged. ago... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and i was like <laughs> again like even even uh, it, regardless of how you feel about the movie he was just in where he played super mario i don't know what that was but like his he was weird in a movie decisions, where he played super mario he does the offensive italian accent the whole time house of gucci uh, yeah some people liked it some people didn't but it was something jared leto doesn't do anything in this movie you could replace him with almost any actor in its exact same performance it's a very strangely muted performance from jared leto i don't know if he was going for something. Did he send any um, blood bags to people on set? <laughs> he spent, <laughs> he spent nights murdering people in the alleyways and drinking <laughs> their blood. It's there, there's just so little going on here. And every, again, every decision they make is so strange. Like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't know why the movie begins with extended flashbacks that actually don't end at any point. The movie just be, it's just at, at a certain point, it just hits the normal timeline and just keeps going. Like the editing is really strange. I was so lost in this movie. <laughs> I the beginning, I was like, because I don't. I, it flashes back, and then they never tell you they flash forward again. I don't. So I don't mind that because I don't need a movie to just like open up on trees and then tell me we're in like Costa Rica. Like, just I get it. Like, just that's always been something but, that I find annoying. But um, <laughs> they can just start it. What I didn't like was that the beginning. I thought it was in a foreign country, and then it goes to Sweden, but then it comes back to New York. So now I'm thinking Milo lives in Europe and and Morbius lives in New York. And then later, by the end of the movie, I'm like, oh, no, Milo just has a penthouse in New York. Why does it look like he lives on a beach? But then, no, wait, no, wait, I think he does live on a beach because... Wait, I don't. <laughs> yeah, we'll just clip blame reshoots. Oh, My... I can't figure it out. I couldn't figure out the setting in this movie. That's what I don't know. What I didn't understand is when when the kids when you see Morbius and Milo as kids, they mention like this is like one of the only places you can be safe. This is one of the places we can give you the care you need. And like five minutes later, they're like Morbius, we're sending you to a special school in New York. I was like, so are they gonna? Is that also good for him? Like they make great care to mention this is like the one place he can go to where he won't die. And then five minutes later, they send him somewhere else. Do you think there is a much longer cut of this movie? Well, for starters, most movies always have a longer cut, but I mean like a much longer cut for this so one. Tyrese Gibson's character, Simon Stroud, is a comic book character. His thing is he just kind of chases Morbius around and other supernatural characters. And he's in the trailers. He has like he has like a cybernetic arm thing and he's supposed to have action scenes. Which not only does he not have action scenes, the whole cybernetic arm thing, it just isn't in the movie. There's multiple cutscenes from the trailer. I don't know if I want more of this movie by any stretch of the imagination. No, 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 no. I'm not going to will that into the existence. The superpowers of the vampires don't make any sense. 
They just have superpowers. Like, they're not vampire specific. Why can't they turn into bats? You're already doing gross <laughs> things with their ears. Just turn them into bats. That would have been so fun. They just, they can fly. They have super What strength. we do in the shadows. Bat fight. Yeah. Bat fight. <laughs> he grabs the bat with his hand and throws it into the wall. <laughs> it's there's, so funny. There's so many things you could do with the, like, I can see why on paper. A studio executive would be like, oh, yeah, vamp- kids love vampires. Vampires are all the rage. Vampires yeah. are cool. Because they haven't watched vampire stuff in like 15 years. So they don't know that vampires have both gone passe and now could be revived. And they're like, oh, he's a vampire. He's an antihero. You could fight other monsters. Sick. Make a movie out of that. It's like, like, yeah, on paper, this sounds great. And a lot of these Sony villain characters on paper could make movies like Craven the Hunter to, to touch upon that. He is a mercenary with a penchant to specifically go after difficult prey because he's like a big game hunter mercenary. You can make a million action movies out of that premise. Chameleon has also been cast in the movie. He's briefly mentioned, referenced in this movie, who is just like literally a mercenary who can just take on disguises like John, Jean Parmesan. Uh, great. Like, let's just <laughs> do that. That sounds great. Russell Crowe has been cast in the movie as well. That's a movie. The problem is like, you have to like do something with the pre- president with the premise to elevate the characters to something else, because unlike other superheroes where just the virtue of being connected to Marvel could kind of carry the movie to an extent, these are a specifically villain characters and B most of them are only interesting because of their relationship to Spider-Man. And with that element gone, Michael Morbius doesn't have much going on as a Spider-Man villain where Spider-Man is beating him up, but he's like, Hey, this guy, it's not his fault. He's a vampire. That's a character. That's a character. Spider-Man can feel bad about. That's a character. Spider-Man can help. Uh, Michael Morbius, like initially, the reason they even tangle up is Spider-Man thinks that he might be able to cure his Spider-Man-ness because he wants to be a normal person. This is around the time he also gets the six arm thing that is just horrifying. I have have an action figure of that in my office, (laughs) but that's a character. But when you remove that from him, he's just a vampire and not the right reasons for him to do stuff. And they never get to that part in the movie where it's just, I don't know, his girlfriend's in danger. His friend's a vampire. Can't have that. <laughs> so he's got to stop that guy. And then when he stops, when he kills Matt Smith, the movie just ends because there's nothing else for him to do. It literally just stops being happening. He he uh, pulls a matrix, man. He just flies. He, j- <laughs> he jumps to the screen. Dude, my audience groaned when the movie ended. They were just like, oh, like that's it. There was one awkward clap. There was one awkward clap in uh, my theater. In my theater, there was a... Uh, mother and father with two kids. There's a baby, like a baby baby. And then like a four-year-old who was decked out in Spider-Man gear, whose favorite part of the movie was the Across the Spider-Verse trailer that played before the movie. That the was whole dope. movie, he that was, was it looks so good. The whole movie, he was he either was terrified because there's monsters on screen, or he was bored wondering when Spider-Man would show up. And not fun. Yeah, uh, the baby cried for the whole movie. And no one in my theater said anything because none of them really enjoyed the movies. They're just kind of like, eh, it's not worth getting <laughs> At a refund. At least this produces feelings in me. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm mad about something. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, during the post credit scene, the father just went, I don't know who that is or why he's here. <laughs> and I was like, hey, man, even I know I know who that is. And I'm not sure why he's there. So I'm just yeah. taking the post credit scene now. Melvin, do you want to explain what happens in post credit scenes? Uh, it's man, it's like Batman. They just they, they Batman do it. shows up. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, they Keaton. just they make it. They they set things up. They introduce a character that we have already known, and they have intentions to use that to jump off and do other things. And it's both the worst parts of the movie. Well, actually, that's that can be debated because it's so different from the movie, kind of like the end of Venom two where the best part is the end credit scene. But this is like, this is like the reverse. I don't, I hate this movie. I I don't know. (laughs) It's like, it's so frustrating, but it's also like I drove home and I thought to myself, I will forget about this movie. (laughs) And then like this morning I woke up and said, Oh, cat, Matt Smith was in that. (laughs) Like, like I am, it's, it's, I am like, I have borrowed knowledge of the future of how to forget things in the present. And that's what this movie was. Whereas I'm watching it, it's filtering out and pulling things with it. But anyways, this end credit scene is just the, the worst CGI in the movie of the multiverse opening up in the sky. It looked really bad. It looked like, like a PowerPoint. In no way home, like in no way home. And then Michael Keaton 
as Batman <laughs> is um, is uh, inside of a prison cell and he's totally OK with it and says, I hope the food's better. Haha, ha, Marvel zinger. Um, no, he's not as Batman. He's as uh, his character Vulture. Adrian Toomes, the Vulture. They uh, do interesting multiverse stuff of like, uh, what do we do about this random person that just appeared in here? Which is interesting, but it's also like this in this particular universe. Uh, we don't really know what's normal regarding superhero stuff. That's a good point. So like, why would they just... This sounds like something the CIA or like the... Area 51 or like really secret stuff would handle, but then it's just immediately on the news because a random person appears in New York. So they might as well just be like a homeless person broke into this. You prison. think Simon Stroud or someone would be the guy, right? How do you mean? Like given that he's like specifically hunting down like a vampire, wouldn't he be like the guy now? It's like Simon, you like weird cases, right? Cause that'd be like Who's the Simon? character thing. Who's Terry this? Gibson. Oh, Oh, him, him, him. Yeah, man, this movie sucks. I don't know anyone's <laughs> name. <laughs> I don't know anything. Fair. Um, but uh, Vulture then gets out of prison. Cool, whatever. More credits start happening. And then it's just the scene continued, but like with other scenes in the middle cut out because <laughs> it could have been an interesting movie to start with that. Yeah, it would have been its own movie, frankly. And then Morbius is just in the middle of a field, totally different cinematography that actually, frankly, looks quite good. And Vulture just has all of his stuff now because I guess, I don't know. It's like when you do New Game Plus and you get to keep all your items, but you're in a different <laughs> game. <laughs> and he just has his Vulture suit and is like, uh, I don't know why I'm here, but I bet it's Spider-Man's fault. And Morbius is like, mm, yes, I know exactly who <laughs> Spider-Man is. <laughs> um, and that's the end. That's it. Uh, this sucks. I think it's oh, weird. Um, it's, it's It's so confusing for so many reasons. Yeah, like you said, I thought it was interesting that they were like, well, he just appeared in prison and we can't keep him locked up because he doesn't exist. <laughs> like, who's Adrian yeah. Toomes? And that's interesting. Yeah. And then there's just a non-specific time. It's very jump. Calvinist of them to presume that he's neither good nor bad. Just as God <laughs> he's chooses who is his he before is they've ever good, done good or bad. I mean, I guess you can't just be like, well, if he's in prison, he'll be a bad guy, right? <laughs> like, that, that will hold up in court. <laughs> that would be great if he's, he's like, in court. <laughs> they're like, how'd you get in here? He's like, well, in my universe, I was in prison and now I'm in a different prison. And they're like, well, uh, we should keep you locked up. If, then. <laughs> if you said I was in an alternate universe. And he started explaining how Iron Man, a guy with the robot suit, cost me my job. They'd be like, oh, he's uh, send, send him to whatever our version of Arkham is. Mental like, health. Clear, yeah. Clearly. And yeah, so Morbius goes to a field and then Vulture just has his Vulture suit again. D did OK, A, it materialized with him, which makes zero sense. B. Yeah. Wasn't it built out of. It was Chitauri sort of tech. Yeah, from... it was sort of built out of the alien tech. So how would they like what <laughs> is there even vibranium in this world? Like is Wakanda a thing? I don't even know. <laughs> so <laughs> some people... I get it. OK, it's a comic book like comic yeah, book cares? stuff can do whatever. But the problem is that Sony is this building that is perpetually on fire and they're expecting people to write scripts on paper. And I just and it's like it's like the scene in SpongeBob when the old man finishes his memoir in red ink and then like red juice flows into the room <laughs> and covers it in red. It's like it's it's just a mess and it's always a mess. But they're so desperate to make things. I just wish it wasn't so distinct, the difference in quality and execution between Disney Marvel and Sony Marvel. Like why? Why do they have such bad writers? Why do they have what is going on? Does Disney does is Disney like, yeah, okay, we'll throw you a bone in association association with Marvel, <laughs> nudge nudge. Yeah, here's some writers. And it's like the people, the interns that like clearly showed no promise, but you didn't feel good enough saying you're not very good at this. We should find you a different field to be in. What's going on? Yeah, I, I have I have thoughts on that. But for a brief second, can I continue to complain about the post credit scene real yes, quick? Yes, of course. It, well, <laughs> this whole movie is a complaint. I, that's the title. There you go. Morbius, a complaint. <laughs> Dear Sony, a an open letter. <laughs> an open letter to Amy Pascal, uh, Avi Arad. And... So some people have theorized that maybe he just got the vulture suit. Like Some people theorize that this does in fact take place in the Amazing Spider-Man universe. And he's just using the vulture suit that we saw in Oscorp. It's clearly not the No Way Home universe. 
Um, Daily Bugle being a newspaper and not an Alex Jones equivalent makes sense. So I also, get that. he he clearly has been transported from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, correct? To this, but that also does, like again, I am a stupid idiot for even complaining about the logic of Doctor Strange's spell at the end of No Way Home. There's a million logic. He does do it, it like five times, though. So the idea of characters being thrown around, like, OK, fine. It sounds like Multiverse of Madness is but sort of predicated on specifically, specifically, he brought in people from other universes who knew Peter Parker Spider-Man and sent them back to the world. So I guess I guess something got mixed up and Michael Keaton does know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So maybe yeah, the spell got messed maybe up. not. I, he just knows Spider Man, but he doesn't know Peter Parker's Spider Man. He knew Peter. He knows Peter Parker's Spider Man. Well, he knew it then, but now he probably doesn't because of the spell. Right, Unless but, the next movie they just change but that. But the and... spell also sent people, well, the villains, back to their worlds. So maybe, yeah, okay, it doesn't make any sense. Like I'm trying, I'm trying to to make some sense of this. It makes zero sense for him to be there. It makes zero sense for him to have the vulture suit again, unless the time jump between when he gets to Roost in prison when he sees Michael Morbius is like six months or something. Or he's just that good, man. He's just that good. He can make, <laughs> he can make the Vulture suit in any universe. But the most it's puzzling... too big brain, man. I can't keep up. <laughs> he's just like, I've been following you. I'll put on my clown paint next time I go to see Morbius too. I, I've been seeing some... <laughs> uh, I've been seeing some people go, it makes no sense that Vulture and Morbius would team up to kill Spider-Man. Which is true. It makes zero sense. For all it doesn't know, make sense because... All of these villains are turned into heroes in these movies. Yes. If if they were, if like in Morbius, he was eating people. And so like the movie was him going crazy as he's like, I can't stop eating people, but I don't want <laughs> That's to. That's like Pringles, you know. <laughs> that would be really pop. cool because then he maybe... Maybe the Sinister Six is a bunch of <laughs> uh, Villains Anonymous members going, hey, we are trying to get better, but this Spider-Man keeps breaking my arm, which like makes me it sad, yeah. so my mental health is bad, <laughs> so I gotta go eat people to feel better. So then they're like, well, if we just defeat Spider-Man, we don't need to keep going to Villains Anonymous and taking methadone anymore. Like, like it would be great, but they don't have motivation to like go against him, plus Spider-Man. I mean... <laughs> It's it's in a different universe, so they could just be like Spider Man's been beating us up already. Yeah, like that's Chris fine. Chris Pine Spider Man from Spider Spider Verse or you know, whatever. Well, I will say that if you actually really listen to their dialogue, they don't necessarily say that they're going to beat up Spider Man or whatever. And they just Vulture just blames Spider Man. Yeah, the weird thing is Vulture just goes Spider Man, and Morbius is like, yes, that makes sense. So either A, there is a Spider Man in this universe, and he just thinks he's talking about that one, or B. He's like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't upset the guy with giant vulture wings. So I'll just keep listening. Which I can easily excuse the fact that they all know who Spider-Man is because the Daily Bugle exists. Because Daily Bugle would just go, menace! And it's the Spider-Man face. Like, okay, yeah. I can accept it without them mentioning it, which I don't know why they didn't just mention it. If if we if we take them a good faith and assume that there's some sort of plan here, and they'll just be like, oh yeah, there's been a Spider-Man. It's this guy. He's been active as Spider-Man the whole time. He just... Never felt like stopping Venom or Morbius. It's Tyrese Gibson. It's just, <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. But what he says, what he verbatim says is, I think I've been following you, he says, which is weird. But he's like, I think guys like us, we could do some good together. So maybe this is, uh, maybe someone Sony's at Sony. Sony's Avengers? So maybe, well, or maybe he re- <laughs> someone at Sony recently watched one of them Suicide Squad movies. And they're just like, hey, a team of anti-heroes teaming to fight just a really bad villain. That could be something, right? And so like, we got villains. <laughs> we got tons of villains. Let's just and a lot of them are basically mercenary ca- suicide squaddy characters, right? You just have a vulture guy, you got a craven guy who just kills people. You have black cat, you got silver sable, rhino, I guess. But why not? Why not make it so my I'm thinking that maybe their Sinister Six won't even fight Spider-Man. Like, what if they just fight another villain they have the rights to? You know what I mean? Or they use Madame Madame Web is supposed to open up the multiverse again for the fiftieth time, I guess. Because <sighs> this is the multiverse is this generation's Dark Knight thing, where the Nolan Batman movies convinced everyone the only way to make comic book movies for a little bit was to be super serious and pretend they weren't superhero movies. Now we got multiverse, where you're just going like, ah, why not? So, like, maybe it's a multiverse. Maybe they fight an evil Spider-Man. Maybe they fight an evil Sinister Six from another universe. Or maybe there's some big 
all the multiverse will collapse because something stupid's happening. And for some reason, the literally infinite number of superheroes can't stop it. So it's got to be Vulture and Morbius and Venom, I guess, teaming up to stop it. I don't know. It, however you cut it, I'm not excited. It's just... It's terrible. It's... it's Yeah, it, it's a thing where, like... It, and I get it, they're trying to do their own thing. But two out of three of these movies that they've released so far have literally included characters from the MCU in some capacity. Like, if you're going to be mcu adjacent just bite the bullet and bring kevin feige in as a producer on these things or something because right now they're just half-heartedly like they, they are not without precedent expecting that their loose connection to a popular franchise will carry all of the shortcomings you know it's like who cares if like who cares if this movie's bad because everyone's just gonna be talking about the fact the villain from the first firing movie shows up you know who cares if venom 2 is not great it literally ends with Venom getting sent to the MCU. And that's all anyone's going to talk about. And so the completionist people like myself are just going to be suckers and just, right. I got to watch it. I got to watch it. I got to keep up because it's, if I miss a thing, but I'm going to say this, there's just, there's just no reason to watch this. There's no reason to watch Morbius. You can absolutely none. You can read the Wikipedia and get just as much understanding of his character. And even then, like whenever, if, and when he shows up in something else, it's a he's a vampire. The end. What a terrible date night to go see this movie. <laughs> was it a date night for you? Uh, no. But when I was leaving, Catherine did say, maybe we should just do a double feature. And I was like, uh, I'm tired and I have a recording in the morning. <laughs> but because this movie was exhausting. But here I am. On it's the only AMC 90 app. minutes. I'm on the AMC <laughs> app. I'm going to tell you guys what else is in theaters that's worth checking out. Uh, you can still <laughs> go see the Batman. Uh, I have been hearing great things about everything, everywhere, all at once. So if you want a multiverse movie, you could just watch that one. Um, I have friends who like Jujutsu Kaisen. That's in theaters. Uh, there's a Channing Tatum movie called Dog. Uh, that sounds like it'd be more entertaining. If you're a weirdo sex pervert, you can go see X. Uh, <laughs> there is The Contractor with Chris Pine. And <laughs> Chris Pine's name is almost the size of the title of the movie. So Always it's really a good just, sign. Just a vehicle for I them. I have so many DVDs where like, the name Chuck Norris or Arnold Schwarzenegger is like, twice as big as the title. There is another horror. There's another movie with Sandra Oh named Uma. Uh, that is a, so there's two movies right now with... Um, eastern leads which is great uh good to see death on the nile so if you just want a mystery that looks like it's um that's still in theaters that's still in theaters and isn't it on streaming i don't know but i know that i heard that it's kind of a mess but the other one was a mess too (laughs) and i heard gal gadot is just annoying in that movie apparently scream is also in theaters so you could just go catch that because that was great uh i just love that the poster says all new movie i feel like that's just got such good self awareness. One hundred percent new thing. scream. <laughs> Look, just go watch those. Don't don't even don't, heck. Just watch something on streaming. I don't know, but a date night. You want to go out? Don't just don't go see this. This is lame. It's just it's embarrassing. If I went on a date with you, <laughs> yes, you listener. and we saw this, I would break up with you because I'd be so embarrassed. Even though you picked the movie, you psycho. <laughs> like, yeah. how dare you not stop this me? This is your this. fault. You should have prevented me. This is what dating and marriage is supposed to be for. You support and help one another. <laughs> you don't I want made a bad Morbius. choice and you didn't stop me. Oh my gosh. I And to be 110% clear, I just want to make this very clear. I'm not one of these weird people that thinks that any Marvel movie not made by Disney is automatically bad. To the contrary, I think by far some of the best Marvel movies had zero involvement from Disney. But this is literally just, this is a knockoff of a knockoff. If you think... If you think McDonald's is bad, this is like one of those weird fake McDonald's. That, like, McDonald's. Wick Do- Whack Donald's. McDonald's you know? McDo. It, yeah. is, it, it, it is. It is a derivative. You like all, it has all of the negatives of an. It MCU is whisper movie. down the lane Marvel. Yeah, it's it's it ha- it's is is made by studio. It is cynically made to fit into a larger franchise. It doesn't take risks. It is they're trying to make as mass appeal as possible. Without any of the things that make the Marvel movies work, it doesn't have the oversight. It doesn't have the charismatic lead. It doesn't have the intriguing characters. It doesn't have fun action set pieces. It doesn't have any sort of heart. There's no respect for the source material. It is just, it is a soulless version of an already overly corporatized genre, which if that sounds real bad, well, 
that's because it is it like i don't think disney has some birthright to spider-man ip but man oh man just watch spider-man movies within the disney machine and watch them without and you can't you can't you can't pretend they're the same i'm sorry they one is one is yeah it's mc movies they're safe they're dependable they very rarely exceed my expectations i i admit all of that but this didn't this this was this is even below expectations i i expected a funny bad movie that was my expectation and it couldn't get chuckles out of me it couldn't it 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 just made me sad and mad at the same time. I literally left the theater going, why was that so bad? Like, I, I can't help but keep focusing on the lack of vampire things. It's because it's the one defining factor of this movie. I was like, what if, because listen, I like vampire stuff. I own all the vampires Underworld. are so cool. I own all the Underworld movies on DVD. Like, listen, my. Oh, man, those are great. I, that first one is so good. It gets way better. You get to the halfway point and Underworld just progressively gets more and more interesting. I'm, and then I'm it's got gonna, a full bodysuit. It's great. It's I, yeah, so cool. I'm not going to pretend like those are, you know. Deep lore. It's really good. They're not. It's it's no Lost Boys or Near Dark or, or but it's anything cool. like that. But yeah, but it's cool. It's fun vampires are shooting guns at each other that's the whole thing like it and to not to make an extremely unfair comparison but look at blade okay blade contrary to popular belief blade was not popular because it was a marvel comic book character like blade came out in 1998 the marvel boom not only was that not a thing this is when marvel was going was just out of bankruptcy okay and nobody saw blade because blade was a super popular comic book character i still know people who do not know that Blade is a Marvel comic book character. They just know Blade as Wesley Snipes, you know? Um, Blade was popular because it it was very cool for the time. It was the style of the time, but it was Wesley Snipes is cool, and he's dressed in black, and he's a vampire, and he's stabbing people with swords. That's all you need, man. People like vampires. People. It was a horror vampire movie. The opening sequence of the movie is people literally getting showered blood as Blade just murders them. This way, this this wasn't your grandpa's Morbius movie. This was a this was a vampire horror film that just happened to have a Marvel IP in it. That movie was extremely popular. It launched three. It launched a trilogy of films and a spinoff TV show starring rapper Sticky Fingers. Okay, like this, it was a big hit. And even now, it's like a that's a bankable IP. And they're talking about what if we find a way for Mahershala Ali's played to fight Morbius. And I cannot tell you how little I would care to see that. But like it's proof positive that it doesn't need to be tied to the MCU. It doesn't need to have cameos from Spider-Man or whatever. You just need to make a solid horror vampire movie and it'll be fine. And it it's it it's it, that's what's so puzzling to me. The blueprint was right there. There's a hundred thousand vampire movies you can point at and be like, that was a good one, that was a good one. And they all made money. This Even Twilight not- has the vampire tension of like, if I do anything, I'll kill this person, but I can't <laughs> resist. Like I- that's all I need in a vampire thing. And then, I know and Twilight's recently been getting some like uh, a weird amount of critical reappraisal. Where everyone's like, "Ah, eh, those weren't that bad." I still think Twilight's pretty they're bad. They're a mess. They're a mess, but they're, they're at least entertaining. But yeah, but man, we remember it. We're ta- there's there's so many references. There's so many quotes. Because you gotta, if you're gonna do a vampire movie, you gotta do sexy vampires. And they just they didn't do sexy vampires. I don't in this, think man. they need. To be, I I don't I don't think you need that. I just think you need to have the basic. I mean, I guess I guess it's something inherently sexy about vampires, as that weird guy in Blade points out. Um, in that one scene where he's interrogating uh, Blade. Uh, but yeah, like the yeah the 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 alluring tension. Uh, this is forbidden fruit. Vampires are forbidden fruit, right? And if you go near it, you become it like you it. everything. It, it costs you your soul, you know. Right. And That's I, all cool. I get that. Yeah, PG thirteen movie. They're not going to do like you know, uh, Queen of the Damned level like weird stuff. But yeah, like it's I yeah I just I just left the theater. I just I and I've been thinking about it since I saw it two days ago, and I keep thinking like, why was that so bad? Because the thing that frustrates me is when I see something that. You can see clear as day everything that, that went wrong. Like, you, there's no reason for this to be like this. It's so sad. It's just so sad. <laughs> like, everything about And now we're gonna, we got Craven the Hunter, which, to be fair, um, already the level of talent is the, the JC Candor, the guy who did the a most violent year in Triple Nine and those movies he's directing. So that sounds good. And like, the good cast. I like Aaron Taylor Johnson. I think he's kind of underrated as an actor. He just doesn't really get a lot of prominent roles for some reason these days. Mm. So, but man, like I just, this made me never want to see another one. He's ever again, a spite 
Like I, I never want to see another Marvel movie. Well, one of these, like, yeah, we're going to see multiverse of madness opening night and we're going to clap and cheer and throw popcorn in the air when Anson Mount reprises his role as black bolt from the Anubis TV show. <laughs> as if rumors are true, uh, man, that's something I never thought I'd see, but it's just, it's just so bad. I, I, I'm, I'm puzzled. I'm befuddled. I am confused and sad. I don't know why this was made as a movie. I don't know why for some reason for like 10 years, they've been like, this guy's the future. We got to make movies out of this guy. I don't, it's just at every conceivable level. It's everything bad about the cynical movie making machine. It ex- this movie exists to exist. It exists to continue the Sony Marvel Spider-Man universe IP and to keep glomming on to that so sweet MCU table scraps as much as they can, where they're literally taking characters from other franchises and sticking them in their franchise. That is like, if this wasn't a better movie, I think it's hilarious, right? Like they literally just zapped mm-hmm. the character mm-hmm. from another movie franchise into their movie franchise. Can you imagine if that happened in something else? Like, can you imagine if in the middle of twilight, like Kate Beckinsale from underworld just got zapped into the world? You're like, yeah, you're in these movies now. And it just, everyone was like, yeah, we're cool. <laughs> can you imagine? I've talked with, you about it, I think, and I've probably talked to you about it with some other people, how the movies for comic books are now cl- becoming much closer to like comic books where you have different canons. And different <laughs> yes. Books. But now we're getting like the really bad parts of what those are, which is when, yeah, like random characters just appear in others and you're like, what? Why? And, <laughs> and they're like, like I'm here now. Just, <laughs> yeah. And and like I, that's part of what happens when you have a bloated market is now you're just getting just a bunch of just a mess of stuff and that's unfortunate because part of that is what can ruin the market i mean disney doesn't want these movies to be done poorly they don't even want dc ones to do poorly because what general audiences see is superhero movie um so when if you have a bad streak of superhero movies it turns people off to all of them which means people won't go see any of them and you so so these movies being bad is just a a bummer (laughs) like i don't know what else to say um obviously i have more to say and i've had more to say but like at the end of the day it's just like a bad movie is a bummer and when you look at it more in a corporate sense it's like uh this being bad is a shame imagine if this was better like it would compel people to be more interested in more subsequent films especially with more multiversal stuff but like it's just bad. So like, does this mean we have to wait a lot longer before another vampire movie comes out now? Because metrics say people didn't like Morbius and that was the biggest vampire movie in the last couple of years or something like that. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a bummer. Yeah. Um, that's the, again, so, I don't want them to take the wrong lessons from this. Which right. Is, but they will because they took the wrong lessons from everything else to make this. So <laughs> that's just what it is. I don't, why is it that like, like, why is it that Sony perpetually keeps making the wrong choices? I, I, and even in other movies, they seem to, cause like the only movie Sony's done in a while, I think that's been particularly good. Sans their Disney corp partnership with her no way home is like, I guess people, well, like their an- animated films are good. They're an- yeah. Their animated stuff is good, but I'm talking live action. Cause like the last good one was probably once upon a time in Hollywood. I can't think of another Sony movie though in a while that's been particularly excellent or excelled yeah i don't think we can fully (laughs) credit sony with what's a fine time in hollywood right of course but i mean like that they've put out yeah i mean i'm literally looking up stuff now because i want to understand and i i can feel some people being a little disappointed with the episode because you don't go into very great detail about what makes morbius um and not recommend but it is so formless and shapeless. Like there's so little happening in it. It makes it hard to comment on it beyond the characters are so threadbare. They're, they're given the barest minimum of what constitutes a movie character. The The movie just progresses at a really sluggish pace despite being so short. Like I'm not kidding when it's like the movie feels like it's the start to like an hour in where I'm just also just filling time while you look up Sony pictures movies, but you there's, there is flashback sequences. You see his childhood, you see him becoming a famous Nobel prize winning doctor. You see him 
working on the serum. You see him curing himself. You see him going back home in the boat. There's like a one kind of fun a few minutes of him realizing his superpowers and figuring what they out, realizing the limitations of his abilities. And then he makes Matt Smith's character upset. And then at some point, Matt Smith steals the serum. And then Morbius briefly gets arrested and blamed for the murder of a nurse, which was actually killed by Matt Smith's character. And then they have tension. And then that's kind of when the movie really gets going. And we're over an hour into the thing at that point. It's, it's the bare bones of what you need to have a superhero plot. And it's so nothing it's and nothing that it's just so hard to recommend unless you're just a huge Morbius fan, I guess. But even then, there's so little of the character. But even then, it's probably just a, a, a bummer. Just yeah. read your favorite Morbius comic. Um, which but really I, did, I did double check Colum- Columbia Pictures Productions, which is a Sony subset. Uh, yeah, it really is like the last not Disney Marvel movie was that was good is Hollywood. Once upon a time in Hollywood, I'm going to list off a couple others um, that they've just done since then. Men in Black International, <laughs> Zombie Land Double Tap, which I liked. The New Charlie's Angels, they did do Little Women, so hey, okay, they got that. Bad Boys for Life, uh, Fantasy Island, followed by Bloodshot, <laughs> uh, The Craft Legacy. Uh, let's move forward. They did Fatherhood, uh, Escape Room Tournament of Champions, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but again, not very big. They did that Cinderella movie, the Oscar nominated Cinderella movie. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife, um, a journal for Jordan, Hotel Transfer Transylvania, and I guess, yeah, they did Uncharted, but like, and Bullet Train looks dope, so uh, whatever. I Bullet guess that's Train cool, but... great. I'm not gonna front on that. Do you think Bloodshot will fight Morbius in the future? Like, hey, he's a, Why who not? cares? Doctor Strange about a valiant comic book character. And then end up in the Ghostbusters world. They're they're really taking hid, hids from the Lego movie than anything. Yeah. Where they're or just going to put Jam everything together. Legacy. Yeah, <laughs> it's a. Uh, it, this is all a disaster, man. Morbius is just disgusting. What do you got for recommendations, Dan? I am going to recommend a type of study Bible slash one specifically because you've mentioned to me that you don't want to keep putting so many things in the description. Just one at a time. Yeah, <laughs> I've only got so much characters I can use in a bio. <laughs> there is a type of study Bible which uh, revolves around a particular author or preacher. Um, one that was recently constantly on sale at Christian Book, for example, was the Charles Spurgeon study Bible where the notes and things came out of his writings. Uh, not a great study Bible in all, all honesty. But one of these that, but I think they can be a really useful tool. Uh, for example, there's things like the Matthew Henry Study Bible, which just takes his exhaustive, like extensive commentary and condenses it down to, to easy study notes. Uh, one particular one in this genre that I think is quite good is the Wearsby Study Bible, uh, based on Warren Wearsby's writing. For those who don't know, Warren Wearsby is a beloved and respected preacher, commentator, writer who is an incredibly prolific writer. He's written at least two or two to three different types of commentaries in every book of the bible he has the famous b series which are technically commentaries but work more almost as study guides slash devotionals he also has a full bible commentary and he's written countless books and preached countless sermons and each thing so the weirds we study bible takes all of his commentary and condenses it down to uh study notes it also includes selections from his b series which are just full things about themes and him really going deeper into particular bits of scripture sprinkled throughout. Plus it, he, uh, there also is throughout uh, at different points, actual preaching outlines as he uh, writes his stuff also for pastors, as he wants these things to be pastoral prep guides. It's a really solid study Bible. I really have liked what I've seen of it. And I was uh, thumbing through it the other day and it's just his writing and Warren Wearsby as a writer, he's not the deepest in terms of, um, being scholarly, but his pastoral instincts and I and his pastoral insights into scripture are just wonderful. I love reading his writing. I love his commentaries. I always uh, check him for reference. He may not be my primary source for writing a sermon or a lesson or something, but I always like uh, checking in on what he has to say. So the Wearsby Study Bible, um, there's multiple editions. It's in multiple formats from genuine leather to hardcover to cloth overboard to, you know, all the various imitation fake uh, pleathers out there. Um, I'm not sure what edition you'll include in the notes, but 
in general, I recommend the study Bible. Uh, for my recommendation, I'm going to recommend a good vampire movie that is more of like a, uh, I don't know, it's the, it's a vampire themed movie. We'll call it that. It's called The Transfiguration. Have you seen The Transfiguration? Kind of I have not. It's an intriguing name, though, I must say. So The Transfiguration is a kind of a vampire movie, kind of not, but it's definitely a dark drama. Uh, very independent, very, I'll say, evenly paced. It's evenly to slow paced uh, by Michael O'Shea, 2016. Uh, the premise is a young child. I think he's probably like 13, 14, believes he is a vampire. He needs to drink blood. Um, he's very into the macabre and he starts to become, he becomes very interested in this girl. But he's also witness to some very traumatic events and things like that. Lives in a very um, low income area. Uh, I'm kind of just going to say that. That's kind of it. It's very good. It's very, it's a hard watch because it's so blunt with its violence and its like subject matter. But it's, and and I would probably put it into a list of depression core films. It's got a very uh, dark take on like, humanity and individual like responsibility but it's very 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 good at, in terms of vampire film and vampire traditionalism uh and yes the uh, most important thing the kid is obsessed with vampires this uh this young kid um it's very good it's it's a i don't know if i would necessarily call it black representation because it's directed by a white man um, that's not bad. Uh, I just know that a lot of people would prefer if it's going to be a um, more black centric film that they were written and directed by a black man. But it's still very good. And that sort of dynamic does play into the film itself. Yes, Transfiguration, very good. Uh, last time I watched it, I gave it eight out of 10. Catherine has given it a nine out of 10. She loves it. Absolutely loves it. If you were a fan of the of Let the Right One In, this one is like that, but with uh, less of budget and probably less i don't know romanticism um which let the right one in very much has uh in such a beautiful sense um it, it doesn't have the cold beauty of let the right one in whereas transfiguration is much more grimy much more uh vile but still very 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 good movie so definitely check that out i'm checking to see where it's streaming looks like you kind of just have to either rent it off voodoo or I'm gonna press if you can rent it on amazon uh yeah you could buy it on prime rent it on prime uh but it's 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 a very 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 good movie so check that out transfiguration so as you might have gathered uh morbius is not a particularly super duper popular comic book character he's made appearances here and there but often morbius who uh yeah uh often he is best as a supporting character he did have one or two solo series here and there um most famous is probably a prequel series to the midnight suns team up and i learned most of this not from reading the comics because i just haven't have no interest in reading them but uh i did uh do some research via one of my favorite youtube channels it is comic tropes he is this really nice guy who makes videos covering comic books he initially started his channel specifically covering particular writers and the tropes they like to utilize However, his channel has expanded and he does full rundowns of famous runs and stories. And anytime one of these movies comes out, I was or TV shows comes out too. I'll just throw on his videos to get a quick uh, like uh, understanding of the characters and stuff. And what sets him apart from other channels, like I know Comics Explained and Emergency Awesome and all these like big channels that like a million subscribers is a I just find his personality very endearing. But also he really gets down to just the important details he specifically will compare and contrast things from the movies and TV show with how it compares to the, to the uh, writing of the characters and the original comic book material and source material. Also, interesting note, he was one of those people who was like a real life superhero. I don't know if you remember that uh, that phenomenon. Like, I think Phoenix Jones is that his name. He was like the most famous one. There's a atrocity oh, like, guide video on him where they like do a vigilantism where they kind of go out in costume and they're yeah. like good for the community. They do support stuff. They're kind of like a community mascot. Um, and then do they do citizen arrest stuff too? Some, they do I citizens think arrest stuff. They carry like, like Narcan and stuff horrible. with them. Yeah. yeah. Um, a, a couple of them have gotten in trouble in the past because they got like too involved in like a physical altercation or something. Right. And the legality of that sort of thing varies from place to place because it is kind of 
for vigilante justice as is as is the case in the source material but he briefly was one of those people too uh which is interesting uh, i didn't even know that until recently because he he needed to make a video to fill like a a, a time thing but he was working on one that was going a little long so he just did a vlog talking about it and i was like shocked but he's a he's a really interesting channel uh it i've been watching him since he only had like five to ten thousand subscribers so watching him become a channel with around 100,000 subscribers is really great so check out comic tropes uh, his the re- the intro to his Morbius video is him in the empty theater opening night, which just him to see Morbius, uh. and he mentions that he had to sat there and he waited, and the movie didn't start. He had to go find someone to turn the movie on because <laughs> they assumed no one bought tickets to it. And he's like, they uh, must have thought I was just a giant Jared Leto fan or something. <laughs> Bravo, but, Sony. So, uh, so comic tropes. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once a month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.